Thank you, Seth, and good morning. It's good to see all of you here. We will return to a normal schedule in this abnormal kind of year that we've been having. Next week, we'll be back in the book of Joshua, but this morning I've taken as our text Luke chapter 12, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 21. Luke 12, beginning with verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and, all, and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and our time in it together. But before I pray, I would like to say just a word about Howard Pryor. Most of you, as I look out on you, uh, knew him. Some of you perhaps did not because for the past, I don't know, five years, he hasn't been here very much. And then he was um, uh, not be able to leave the... Uh, nursing home where he stayed for the past, I'd say, two years. Uh, Howard, if anyone, exemplifies the opposite of this farmer is, is the person that does that. He exemplifies what our Lord said here at the end of verse 21. He was rich toward God. He became a believer. I believe it was shortly after graduating from the Naval Academy and was on a ship at the end of the Second World War and was witnessed to by one of the officers on the ship. He became a believer and he dedicated his life to the Lord's service. And particularly here at Believer's Chapel, he was one of the founding men of the chapel along with Dr. Johnson and for many years was an elder and uh, was a good counselor to many of us younger men, younger at the time. And so we, uh, we, we appreciate Howard very much. He devoted his life to the Lord's service. He is a man who is no doubt missed by his family and certainly by us, but we rejoice because he has entered into his reward and certainly does exemplify the very things that our Lord spoke of and that I'll speak of as, uh, in, in this lesson this morning. Well, let me give thanks for this time together and ask the Lord's blessing upon us as we study. Let's bow in a word of prayer. It's always good to take an account of our lives and reassess our priorities. The new year is approaching, which is the traditional time to do that. But we should always do that in light of Scripture. What does the Bible say? It says, you are just a vapor. We walk about as a phantom. Soon we fly away. Life is short. That should give us perspective. The Lord told a parable to make that point. It's the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. 
The Lord was standing in a large crowd teaching when a man interrupted him and said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Jesus refused and even gave the man a sharp reply. Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? That wasn't an insensitive response, but he had come not to settle financial and legal disputes. That was for the courts of law and human government, not him. As Leon Morris wrote, he came to bring men to God, not to bring property to men. So he refused to settle the man's legal dispute. But he wasn't unconcerned about the man. And he used the opportunity to give him and the crowd a lesson. Because in that man's request, the Lord saw his underlying need. It wasn't money. It wasn't half an inheritance. It wasn't temporal, transient things. His real need was spiritual and eternal blessing, which goes to the very nature of life. And so the Lord warns him and us in verse 15, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, which includes covetousness. It's what the Tenth Commandment warns against. The Proverbs describe the greedy person as a person who craves for more all day long. He's the opposite of the righteous man. Paul warned against it in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. He called greed idolatry. The seriousness of it is seen here in the fact that the Lord gives two warnings right off the, the beginning of it, what he has to say. He says, beware and be on guard. The reason it is so necessary to do that is because greed is based on the false but appealing idea that more, that abundance will make us happy and secure. Just a little bit more. That's why greed is idolatry. People think money and possessions will give them fulfillment in life, that, that it will do for us what only God really can do. And so possessions become their God. Things, though, can't fulfill. I reflected on that statement a few days ago and thought, that is almost a glib statement. How many times growing up did I hear that kind of a statement? Money won't make you happy. And it just doesn't ring true to us, is the reality. But that's the truth. And that's the point that the Lord will make. He explains why that is in the rest of the verse. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Possessions can give pleasure, but they cannot ultimately satisfy because we are not simply physical beings. We're spiritual, and the material cannot satisfy that. Even the Romans understood that, at least some of them did. They had a proverb, money is like seawater. The more a man drinks, the thirstier he becomes. The, the result of drinking in more, the result of grasping for more, is that it makes a person increasingly selfish, increasingly unconcerned for others, and increasingly blind to what is really important. People who are devoted to temporal things are unmindful and unconcerned about eternal things. It's their God. And so they chase shadows and they never come to the substance. That's this man's problem. And the reason he was so concerned with the inheritance. He may have had a legitimate grievance. The, the Lord wasn't taking sides. He wasn't even talking about this issue. He looked deeper into the man and, and saw his fundamental problem. And that was he was a materialist. That was his problem, and, and it's often the problem that each of us has. 
And so this, this incident is really relevant to each of us. And so to illustrate the problem and the danger, the Lord tells a story, a parable, about a rich man whose mind was completely fixed on earthly things. The man was a farmer. He could have been anything. He could have been a doctor. He could have been a lawyer, a banker, a bricklayer. But he was a farmer. And the Lord calls him a fool. Now, he didn't call him a fool because he was naive about the world or stupid about business or because he had gained his wealth by dishonest means. There's no evidence of any of that. And this is not a parable about the evils of money. The scriptures do not condemn wealth in and of itself. Abraham and Job were rich men, and their riches were a gift to them from God. This man's wealth was also a gift from God. In verse 16, the Lord describes the land that he farmed as very productive. Well, that was the result of God's gift to him. It was God's providential goodness to him. He gave him productive ground. And the parable is not against the man's work ethic. He was uh, evidently an industrious, hardworking person. The Bible condones that doesn't condemn hard work. In fact, laziness is as much a sin as greed is. Uh, on the face of it, the man seems wise. But he was a fool. Not because of what he possessed or how he came to possess it, but because of the way he possessed it and let it possess him. He thought that he could find happiness satisfaction and security in earthly abundance. That made him a fool, just as it does us, if that too is our belief. This man had much, and he was blessed with a good harvest. In fact, he had such a big bumper crop that it caused a problem. It was the kind of problem you want if you're a farmer or a businessman. He didn't have enough space in which to store all of his grain. And so in verse 17, the Lord said, he began reasoning to himself about what he should do, where he should store his crops. And that reveals a lot about him. Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, who was in influential in Augustine's conversion, said, the rich man has storage available in the mouths of the needy. There's no hint here that he even considered sharing his abundance with the poor in the land. He wanted it all for himself, for his profit and pleasure. So we read in verse 18, he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I guess that's not all that unusual, really. A number of years ago, in the late 1980s, Fortune magazine did a feature story entitled The Billionaires. And in it, a man named Waldemar Nielsen was quoted. He was uh, a, an expert on foundations. And he said that a high proportion of people who succeed financially have no interest in charity, no causes, no clear-cut interests. Now, there are some examples to that. But on the whole, he said, their lives are their business. Paul called that idolatry. Having more doesn't make people more generous. It can do just the opposite and give them a desire for even more so that they hold on more tightly. This man's life was his business. And the language of the passage suggests that it was all about satisfying self. In the Greek text, the personal pronoun my occurs four times, 
and the personal pronoun I occurs eight times. I and my, it's all about that. He, he was completely self-absorbed. He didn't think of, of anyone else. He didn't think of anything else. His mind was only on the material and on the present and the near future, but not the ultimate future. And so with only that on his mind and, and thinking that he had achieved success, that he had arrived, he made a decision given in verse 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Finally, I can retire. And the Bible is not against retirement. Oftentimes it's necessary. So there's nothing wrong with, with retirement, and there's nothing wrong with planning for retirement. In fact, that's only wise. But this went beyond retirement. He didn't speak of a well-deserved rest. He was speaking of a life of self-indulgence. And as he speaks to himself, his thoughts reveal everything about himself. He was a materialist and an atheist. Now, there are two kinds of atheists. There are theoretical atheists or philosophical atheists, people who don't believe that God exists. There's just this material universe. The cosmos is all there is or ever will be. There's nothing more to everything than the material. So that's a theoretical, philosophical atheist, and there really aren't too many of them. And then there are practical atheists, people who live as though there is no God. There are a lot of them. The farmer was a practical atheist. He makes no mention of God, no acknowledgement of God, expresses no thanks, shows no gratitude, it is all my grain and my goods and what I have done and what I will do. He thought of himself as a self-made man. It was his stuff and he was going to enjoy it and he was going to live life to the full. Because he had many years ahead and he had lots of stuff laid up. Years ago I heard a sermon by Donald Gray Barnhouse in which he said, there is no such thing as a self-made man. And that's true. Again, the Bible teaches hard work and self-reliance. And it speaks of rewards for those that work diligently. We're to do that. We are to be a people of, of discipline and industry. But the Bible also teaches humility. If a man can plow a field or do business, it's because God gave the physical strength or the mental health to do it. And the opportunity, the circumstances that are favorable. This man had favorable circumstances as well as the, the health and the mind to do the work that he did. He had good ground. That's God's gift to him. And it was very productive, the Lord said. That's providence. God gave him the energy to work hard, and he caused the soil to be fruitful for this man. Everything that we have is from God. What we possess as well as the, the time that we have to use it and the opportunities that we have to use it, and it will all be required of us someday. But man by nature does not look at life like that. Human nature is curved in on itself. So people think only of themselves by nature. They don't acknowledge God. They think only of self and their own personal interests. That was certainly true of this man. The things he had obtained by the grace of God became the means of his personal pleasure. 
He was going to take his ease. He was going to eat, drink, and be merry. Now, there's nothing wrong with being merry. There's nothing wrong with eating and drinking and enjoying the good things of life. His resolution to be merry, to be merry did not necessarily mean that he was going to live a hedonistic life of um, dissipation. The problem was how his life revolved around the use and the enjoyment of material things without any thought of his soul and of God and of the future. Now he speaks of his soul. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods. But here the meaning is the equivalent of self. He's not referring to the eternal soul within him. For all of his industry and his planning for the harvest, he didn't plan for eternity. He didn't plan for God's harvest. So the man said, soul, take your ease. But God said, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So suddenly, unexpectedly, at the wrong time, just when the man was about to settle down, rest, and enjoy life, life was over. You are just a vapor, James said. Life is fragile. Life is short. So the wise person takes account of that, knows he or she is just a creature of God, and will stand before him someday. And that day may be soon. Because just as God gave the farmer the fruit of the ground, so too he gave him the days of his life, as he has all of us, and he will require it someday. That's the word our Lord uses. And that word require was used of asking for the return on a loan. That's what our lives are. They are a loan. We are God's creation and possession, and He will want His return on it. That's true of the Christian in a special way, is... Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Of course, the price is the blood of Christ. Now that's his elect. Not everyone has been bought by Christ, but no one is his or her own. We are all, elect and non-elect alike, God's creatures. He owns us all. And he will require a person's soul sometime, and it can be at any time. We don't control that. Ultimately, we don't control our lives. The fool thinks that he does. He thinks that he's the captain of his soul. But none of us is. God controls everything. He controls our destiny. He controls all that it makes us up and all that we have and all that we are. And just as He numbered the hairs of our head, He has numbered the days of our lives. He determined when we would come into this world and He has decreed the day of our departure. So how foolish to think that we can live without a thought of God. Think only of ourselves and determine the course of our lives. You are here only at God's good pleasure. A man may be a captain of industry, employ thousands of people, and control billions of dollars a day, but if he thinks of nothing but money and earthly things, the Lord calls him a fool. They prepare for everything but eternity. Suddenly, they're snatched away in the fullness of life. This very night, your soul is required of you, and now, who will own what you have prepared? Men build their kingdoms. They 
invest time and effort and money in them. They sacrifice health and family for them only to have incompetent heirs fight over the inheritance, fritter it all away, and squander the man's life's work. And so to show the futility and, and folly of living for this world and amassing stuff for self and, and for the perpetuation of one's name, God asked the question, now who will own what you have prepared? The Lord then sums up the parable in verse 21. So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The lesson of the parable is simple. Beware of greed and be rich toward God. When is a person rich toward God? Well, not until he or she is rich in grace and rich in faith and in devotion to the Lord. No one is rich toward God until he or she has been born again and has believed in God's Son. There is no spiritual life outside of Jesus Christ. Sin must first be atoned for, paid for, and the sinner declared right with God before he can be rich toward God. And so a person must first turn to Christ in faith and then live for him. People who are rich in worldly possessions can do that. They can do that. They don't have to be fools. They can be wise in the ways of the world and wise in the ways of heaven. We can retire and enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with that. Paul says rejoice always, Philippians 4.4. 4. Again, I say rejoice. Christians should be joyful people. The question is, what is our joy in? The Shorter Catechism begins with the right question and then it answers it. You know it. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. One of Satan's lies is that God wants to deprive us of joy and fulfillment in life. No, his design is for the greatest fulfillment and lasting joy, but it is in him and finding our purpose in his purpose. Christ said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Wealth and possessions to the degree that you should have them and opportunities will be added to you to serve him. There are many examples of people who have had wealth and have been rich toward God. In, in the book of Luke, for example, later in chapter 19 is Zacchaeus, who saved miraculously and uses all of the wealth that he'd accumulated, and not always in the best way, to bless the people of Jericho. And then there's Joseph of Arimathea. Just a couple of biblical figures that used their wealth well and were rich toward God. Rich men who used it for His glory. Well, that's from the Scriptures, but church history is filled with examples as well. Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf and the Countess of Huntington who, who both used their fortunes, their wealth, to influence those in their day with the gospel provide for many people their material needs and their spiritual needs. And there was William Borden. I've told this before. So some of you have probably heard this, but it fits well with, I think, what our Lord has said. William Borden was very much uh, the kind of person that Jesus spoke about who sought first God's kingdom. He was a son of privilege. He was wealthy, well-educated, and very gifted. 
He graduated from Yale, where he acceler accelerated in, uh, excelled rather, I should say, in academics and athletics. While at Yale, he decided to become a missionary to the Muslims in China to prepare for that ministry. He went to Princeton Seminary, where he was a good student and a leader of students. One of the professors, William Green, would often see Borden out of his window going to class and commented, that man is so strong and is so sane that his prospect of life on earth is better than that of any student in our seminary. Soon after graduating, Borden left for Egypt, where he planned to study Arabic and the Quran before going to China. Before going, he arranged with his father to have his large inheritance given to Christian schools and missions. Then he sailed off to begin his life's work. Soon after arriving in Cairo, he died of meningitis. Now, to many people, his life would seem to have been a complete waste. It, it certainly would have to that man at the beginning of the passage who asked Jesus for help in getting the inheritance. But it didn't to William Borden. His dying testimony was, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. And why should he have had regrets? He was obedient, following God's call, arrived at his God-appointed destination, where God called him home to his eternal reward. He was rich toward God. I'll close with Psalm 39, verses 4 through 6. Here David prayed, Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches, and does not know who will gather them. This year, may God make each of, us, each of us to know our end so that we may live for Him, live to His glory, where we will find fulfillment and real joy, lasting joy, and eternal reward. We will have no regrets. If you're here without Christ, you'll have many regrets. If you've not believed in Him as Savior, may, you make, may He make you to know your end, which is not a pleasant end. It's an end of judgment. You're on the path of the fool. Be wise. Come to Christ. Flee to Him where there is forgiveness of sin and life everlasting, and then live for Him. Live a life that counts for eternity. Be rich toward God. May God help all of us to have that as our ambition and to pursue that as our course. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us and for this parable that the Lord told and that we need to reflect upon. Remember how brief life is and that uh, all that we have is a gift from You and someday it will be required of us. We'll have to give an account. And yet, Lord, You have set before us opportunity that is really a life of fulfillment a life of real joy, a life of real accomplishment. And it's found in your will for us. And so may we seek that and seek to live a life that brings honor to you, glory to you, to our triune God. So Lord, we look to you to bless in that way. We thank you for this time. 
We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's continue with uh, hymn 41 in your handout, Behold the Lamb, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Let's stand and sing, hymn 41. Now is the time for our church's celebration of the Lord's Supper. This will be our last observance of the year 2020. I listened this past week to the last podcast of the year by Albert Moeller, and on that podcast he observed how human history is divided into only two eras, the time before Christ came and the time since. And for centuries, most of the world has measured the calendar years according to their sequence in relation to that, either B.C., before Christ, or A.D., Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. But typical of the unbelieving secular world that strives to remove any reference to the truths of Christ and of the gospel, the powers that be, Uh, eventually altered those designations to B.C.E., before the Common Era, and C.E., the Common Era. Nevertheless, the fact remains, 2020 and soon 2021 uh, mean something. They are chronological markers that hinge on one event of the most monumental consequence, the incarnation of the Son of God who came to earth to offer himself for our sins, the very thing we remember in the Lord's Supper. And unbelievers uh, try as they may to cancel that out, but every time an individual writes or utters the current year or the next year, they unwittingly bear witness to what the number points to. The psalmist wrote of how the nations plot against God and against his Christ while God himself sits in the heavens and laughs. Using the same poetic license, we may say that every time an unbeliever signs a document with the current date on it, God in heaven winks at us. Al Mohler was right in one sense about the two eras of human history, but Christians also know there are more than two eras of redemptive history. Genesis states, in the beginning, God created. Uh, Before time, uh, God existed. John wrote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Before time existed, the triune God was, and he entered into a covenant of redemption in which the Son, the eternal Son, willingly acquiesced to the most extraordinary venture of all time to enter into human history by taking on human flesh and and taking on a human nature, becoming the God-man in order that he might bear the sins of of his people. In human time, he did that. And we have this past week celebrated that incarnation. It happened, well, it happened about 2,020 years ago, maybe 2021. And in the future, we don't know exactly when, uh, time as we know it will come to an end, and Christ will come again to this earth to usher in his kingdom and ultimately an eternity of perfect fellowship between God and his redeemed. We look forward to that, and we remember especially now that Jesus, when he inaugurated this supper with the bread and the cup, he said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In the meantime... Awaiting that, we gather such a sight up here to look out upon you. We gather, as we do today, this last Lord's Day of 2020, and lift up our hearts and minds together, all of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, in obedience 
to remember him as he commanded us when he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. So if you're here with us this morning and you know the Lord Jesus, you are part of his church, recognizing him as the head of the church, we invite you to participate with us in this supper. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we are so grateful for this simple element that you have given us. We say that often. It is a simple element, uh, this unleavened bread that we have broken beforehand, just as you broke it and gave it to your disciples. And now it is time for us, your disciples, to take up the bread and eat it. And as we eat it, remember that you said, this is my body. Of course, you didn't mean it literally. You meant it symbolically. This is my body given for you. And we celebrate and worship as we remember that you gave yourself for our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're here to remember him that through his blood he paid for our sins and transferred us into his kingdom. I would read from Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 to 22. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn born of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet no, he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Paul wrote this letter to refute false teaching in the city, exalt Christ, and explain that we have been made complete in him. He delivered us from the power of darkness. The world was condemned without hope in Adam's sin, in our sins. There was no light and love in the hearts of men. Every thought and intention was evil continually, we know from Genesis. Because of great, God's great love, he sent his son to the world to rescue us. He plucked us up, transferred us into the kingdom of Christ. We had no part in that. The Lord is the agent. We have redemption, forgiveness of sins. He created it all. Mark mentioned that he created the galaxies, the close galaxies, the galaxies far away. Anything was created by him. He also created the smallest particles that the physicists ever have found or will ever be able to find. He created them. They are not there by some coincidence. He created them. He created kings, rulers, and principalities. 
from past time, present time, and in all future times. He is the image of the invisible God. What a comfort that is. A question that has been asked by many intellectuals, philosophers during the ages is, who is God? What is God? Many answers have been given and much has been debated. What is God? At Christmas time, we learn different theories about who God is. Is he dead? Is he alive? And so on. Complex answers, but it's so simple. God is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talked about in the scripture. Holy Spirit talks to us in our heart and made us believe it. God is revealed to us. He was revealed in him. He is the image of God. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. It's simple for a Christian to answer the question, who is God, what is God? It's that simple. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. This truth will never change. From eternity past to eternity future. We know from Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you have formed the earth and the world, ever from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And then finally, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Let's remember him. That by his sacrifice and his sacrifice only, he presents us holy and blameless before the Father. Let's give thanks, thanks for the wine. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you in thankfulness for the love and grace that you have given to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him and that he willingly, as the unblemished Lamb of God, shed his blood for our transgressions. Help us to live a life of obedience and love and that we'll be able to stand up to the world and proclaim the truth until you return. Whether we or at home, or if we are here in person. We praise your Father and we thank you for your Son in his sacrifice and we look forward to his return. We now pray that we'll be able to take the wine in a worthy manner. Amen. Recorded for us in Exodus chapter 33 is Moses' petition to God. When he says, I beseech thee, Lord, show me thy glory. Mr. Spurgeon, in his sermon on that text, said that in particular he saw two of God's attributes exposed in his answer to Moses. He saw his goodness in that he revealed to sinful man his glory. And he saw his sovereignty in that he did not reveal that to all but to some. The implication I think that we see also in that text is this. Moses could not see the glory of God in and of himself. It had to be shown him. It had to be revealed to him. Similarly, S. Lewis Johnson stood in this auditorium many, many years ago, and he uttered a statement which God has burned, has branded, into my heart and soul forever. And this is what he said. If you forget everything I have sought to teach you, 
Never forget. Never forget your inability. Your inability to properly comprehend your sin. Your inability to really comprehend the depth of that sin. Your inability to properly understand who Jesus Christ really is and what He has done. I believe that that inability is the cornerstone, is the pillar of these glorious doctrines of grace that we cherish and hold so dear here. And Howard Pryor today would say, the inability, the thing that we should remember first and foremost, yes, Amen. And never forget it. Those doctrines have been play, have been proclaimed, defended, protected here for the low these many years. And your elders pray individually, corporately that the men who would be considered here for leadership in the years to come before our Lord returns also would have that glorious truth of our utter and total inability to comprehend the salvation that comes through the work and the atoning work of our Lord Jesus Christ would have that truth burned and branded within their hearts as well. And I don't want to sound harsh, but I would simply add to that my own prayer, that if that man who was being considered ever in a leadership position here, who did not have that truth branded upon his heart, that the Lord would very gently and kindly lead him down the street. I believe that this inability is the key to the glories of the ministry that we have all enjoyed here over the years. We should never lose them. And as Dr. Johnson said, there's a hidden blessing to it. Because when we get to heaven, we aren't going to have to take Theology 101. Thank you for listening to the ramblings of an old man. Shall we pray? Lord, thank you that in your marvelous goodness and providence you placed us here. For it has been a great blessing to us, to our families. And we do pray that you might be pleased to continue the proclamation, the defense of these glorious doctrines, and particularly that of our inability until our Lord returns. Not because we're championing tradition, but rather we are championing the veracity and truthfulness of the Word of God. And a Word of God that brings honor and glory to you and elevates you to your rightful position. Salvation is of the Lord. The words of Robert Murray McShane come to my mind as I think about the depths to which we owe you. For nearly 200 years ago, he said, 
when I stand before the throne dressed in beauty, not my own. When I see you as you are, love you with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Thank you for such a salvation. And thank you for a future that neither moth nor rust will destroy the blessings of forgiveness and eternal life that are all locked up in the salvation that we enjoy in him. For it's in his name that we ask all of these things. Amen.